The method of political economy is an essentially a prioristic and deductive method. What do I mean when I say the method of political economy is a prioristic? That is what the pyramid on the right side of the blackboard represents. I mean that we construct our discipline in the following way. We always begin with an axiom, an irreducible assumption which is represented by the vertex at the top. We've already discussed this in class. We've said that the starting point, the irreducible assumption, which leaves room for no other in economic theory, is always the concept of human action. It is an irreducible assumption. It is self-evident. We cannot deny that the cornerstone on which the theoretical edifice of economics rests is human action without contradicting ourselves. In other words, if I deny that the starting point for the process of building the methodology of economics is human action, I am guilty of an unresolvable logical contradiction, for my denial is precisely a human action. My objective? To make a denial. My means, I launch into an explanation here, etc. I am acting. Furthermore, this concept is obvious to us, not only in the sense that we cannot deny it without contradicting ourselves, in other words, it is axiomatic, but also because intimate experience, through introspection, shows each and every one of us human actors what action is, that it is the ultimate element that there is none more fundamental, and we build our discipline upon it. This knowledge, which Mises describes beginning on page 64 of Human Action, is not only the starting point and the axiom, it is the theoretical cornerstone. In itself, it is theoretical knowledge, even if embryonic, in other words, incipient. And as theoretical, though perhaps very elementary knowledge, it enables us to interpret some of what goes on around us. It permits us, so to speak, to make a primary interpretation of historical reality. This is what I want to show. This theoretical knowledge, which is the preliminary axiom, allows us to interpret some, though a small part, of the history around us. In fact, the process by which our minds develop also provides an illustration. Many of us may have a little brother or sister. We start out as babies. Actually, in the beginning, a newborn is almost like a vegetable. But what a vegetable! A baby has a brain with 150 billion neurons in it, and she starts learning right away. After a few days, a few weeks, a few months, a baby has learned things. She begins by learning that if she cries, she is fed. A baby who doesn't cry isn't fed. So, wah, wah, ah, they're feeding me, or they're giving me a bottle. We learn this immediately, and we all learned it as tiny babies. We start to develop knowledge when we are very young. We start to act very early, and this allows us to interpret things. What we first see as lights, we come to recognize as our mother. We can't do anything by ourselves. However, we are already interpreting some of what goes on around us, thanks to our prior, a priori, conceptual framework, which enables us to see the world. So, when we are small, we can already interpret some of the reality that surrounds us. Now, I'm going to carry out a more in-depth analysis of the human actions to which I suppose the principle of the disutility of labor applies. As we saw before, I believe this is the relevant focus in the historical world around me. So, the theorist continually selects, as it were, part of the historical reality he has been able to interpret in light of a prior theory. And he reintroduces this part in his analysis in the form of assumptions he considers potentially relevant. He reintroduces it in the form of assumptions. And through the corresponding chain of logical deductive reasoning, he arrives at more profound, more detailed economic or theoretical laws. These more profound or detailed economic laws are like a new pair of prescription glasses that are much more finely adjusted to the theorist's eyesight and permit him to interpret a much larger number of historical phenomena. That's why I've made this H larger than the one before. 
And from this history that surrounds the theorist, which his theory now enables him to interpret more broadly and in much greater detail, he can in turn select other assumptions he considers relevant and reintroduce them into the corresponding chain of logical deductive reasoning to arrive at economic laws that are even broader and more profound, detailed and explanatory. These laws in turn will permit the theorist to present an even broader view of history, from which to derive assumptions he will reintroduce into the corresponding chain of logical deductive reasoning to arrive at yet broader and more detailed laws, and so on, in a never-ending process of building economic science. We will do some of this together, because next week we will be studying individual human action, the action of one person alone. We will make an assumption. We will assume Robinson Crusoe is alone on his island. Friday hasn't even arrived yet. And we will study the principle of marginal utility for an isolated actor. That will permit us to interpret a larger part of historical reality, which will lead us to another assumption. We will assume he is not alone, but with other people. And we will follow our chain of logical deductive reasoning and formulate a theory of exchange and of prices. But when we formulate our theory of exchange and of prices, we will initially suppose the exchanges are direct, which is called bartering. That will enable us to interpret real phenomena. But we will note that in real life, people use money. So we will introduce money as a commonly and generally accepted medium of exchange, which will permit us to develop much more complex laws, the general theory of prices in monetary units. But then, with the introduction of money, we will see that money can be public or private. It can be manipulated or not. Its quantity can be increased or decreased. And it is related to the interest rate. We will make additional assumptions and develop an entire theory of economic cycles and capital. And so the process continues and becomes continually broader and richer. That is the a prioristic and deductive process. A prioristic, a priori, in the sense that economic science is always a priori. It is not derived a posteriori from knowledge of history, but instead it must exist prior to history. We begin with an axiom and we gradually expand the laws which become increasingly complex through the corresponding chain of logical deductive reasoning and the introduction of the theoretical assumptions we consider potentially relevant.